just a bit outside presented by Wafed Bank. Join a best bank at wafedbank.com. I'm Michelle Ledka and we have got a great show in store for you this week. But before we get going, I am happy to report that Just a Bit Outside is now a podcast and you can download and enjoy it wherever you get your podcasts. This week, I catch up with Sounders head coach Brian Schmetzer. We talk contract extensions, Jordan Morris to Swansea and how he plans on replacing him in the interim and also some red wine. But to start things off, let's check in on our hot topics presented by Wafed Bank as our experts weigh in from the sidelines. Joining us now to give us their hot takes from the sidelines, Q13's Aaron Levine, Seahawks linebacker KJ Wright, and former Seattle Supersonic Detlef Shrimp. Guys, thanks so much for taking the time today to join us. Thank you, thank you. Awesome, let's jump right in. Obviously, the big news this week is we finally know who is playing in Super Bowl 55. It breaks my heart. It couldn't be the Hawks, but if it couldn't be the Hawks, at least we've got a really good matchup in the Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Thoughts on this matchup? What excites you? What intrigues you? Do you have a favorite in this game? I'm going to let, leave it up to KJ to start out on this one because I know I know it hurts him right here. So Yeah, I definitely wish I was there. But um, what Tom Brady has done going to another Super Bowl, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. And as bad as I want to go against them, I got I got the Bucks winning. You know, you got the Chiefs and Ty- Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey. It all looks good on paper. But somehow I feel like he's going to have the ball with two minutes left. And he's going to easily go down and score. And so, you know, for him to, to be in this position is amazing at his age, too. And so um, I, I, I got the books winning. Yeah, 43 years old, KJ. And we have learned to never doubt Tom Brady. The guy is just remarkable. I'm actually going to go with the Chiefs here, though. And I think one of the hardest things to prepare for as a defense is a quarterback's mobility and overall speed on offense. And last week we saw against a really good Buffalo Bills defense, the combination of Mahomes and Tyreek Hill, as you mentioned, and all those other offensive weapons, they can put points up in a hurry. Brady has been prone to making more mistakes this year. I think he threw three interceptions last week in Green Bay. And then I don't think the Chiefs pass rush is getting anywhere close to the love that they should be. And you throw a motivated Frank Clark out there, I think the Chiefs are going to have the edge in this one. By the way, one more thing. Andy Reid, one of the best coming off of bye weeks when he has extra time to prepare. And that's essentially what they're getting with the extra week of preparation this week. I understand all that. All that stuff makes total, complete sense. But when you get in the game, it's like his his presence is like, is, is nothing I've seen before. It's just confidence and calmness. And it's like all this stuff don't even matter whenever they play Tom Brady. <laughs> so... And uh, Super Bowls? I mean, that's that's ridiculous. That, that's ridiculous. It's not even fair. But well, <laughs> he's doing it. That's why he's the goat, right? I mean, I I've never been a fan, you know. Never been a, <laughs> I never always cheered Me against too. New, New Me England, too. but <laughs> you, you get you got to give the dude respect, and he uh, he's his stats are amazing. So, uh, yeah. but I but I'm our KC guy now, so I, I'm I'm going on for the role. I'm going for the you know I'm going for the fun <laughs> stuff. So uh, no analysis here. It's just all emotion. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing we didn't even touch on guys is tampa bay gets to host the super bowl and play in it what, that just doesn't even seem fair count on tom brady being the first player on a team that gets to play a super bowl in their home mm-hmm. stadium right i mean of all the things that he's done so far in his career and he gets to end it at home if you want to call it home since he mm-hmm. was in new orleans i mean excuse me new england for so long yeah they, they have a little bit of the edge you got you know you're comfortable at home you have to get on a plane and travel get to sleep in your same hotel room and so a little bit of edge there but um for them to be at home that is pretty cool wow. how many fans are allowed in the stadium i think you know? it's twenty thousand. yeah 20 22 000, i think yeah. i think the get-in price is somewhere around fifteen thousand dollars a ticket it's unbelievable it's the hottest ticket in town for sure oh, wow. so you're on your way Aaron, huh yeah <laughs> yeah i'm not leaving my house <laughs> I've got a front row seat on my couch for that game. (laughs) We'll move it right along to topic number two in honor of Mr. Shrimps being with us here. We have to talk about the Seattle Supersonics. There's been a lot of talk in the recent weeks that it could finally be happening. The return of the Sonics, thanks to an expansion in the NBA. Do we think this is actually going to happen? Like, I don't know. Should I get my hopes up for this? And if so, like, what would the timing of all of this mean, mean, do you think, to this city and this fan base? 
Well, you know, I like, I uh, get my fingers crossed because after, you know, COVID happened and the way the season, the NBA season unfolded last year, I thought, God, this, you know, this is another setback. This is going to take another five years before there's enough interest, money, all the, all the things you need to, to expand or, or purchase a team or whatever. Uh, and then Adam Silver came out and, and talked about, you know, we're looking at expansion because we're trying to make up a few billion dollars of revenue. Um, and then I'm going, wow, okay. All of a sudden we're back in the ball game, you know, and then, uh, you know, the, the key arena climate change arena is, I don't know if you checked it out, but I have, and, you know, obviously I'm a, if you can see it, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a <right>. cracking supporter. <laughs> and, uh, I tell you what, it's, if the Sonics come back, that place is unbelievable. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all in, uh, reality is if they say tomorrow, yes, we're going <laughs> to expand. It's probably still three years away. Yeah, the, the city of Seattle is already perfect, but if they could add a basketball team to this, it'll, it'll just put icing on the cake. Me, I, me and the guys talk about it all the time. We wish it could be one of those teams where the football players are sitting on court side, me and the basketball players. And so um, that'd be super cool if they can make that happen. And so I got my fingers crossed as well. Yeah, I mean, listen, this city supported the Sonics for four decades. I still get goosebumps, even though the Sonics were so terrible their last year in Seattle. That last home game against the Dallas Mavericks with everybody shouting, save our Sonics. That was one of the few wins Kevin Durant uh, and the Sonics had that year against a really good Mavericks team. And I also remember um, Mark Cuban being there, and he was one of two owners who voted against relocation. So he's obviously for eventually getting a Sonics team back here. But Det talked about it. If the pandemic has done anything good at all, and believe me, we're scraping for positives here, it's that the current sports franchises are looking for more revenue and more cash flow. And the most immediate way to bring money in is expanding the league, splitting the pie up, and I think Forbes just evaluated the average NBA team at $2.6 billion. So let's say the asking price on a new expansion team is $2.5 billion. That means each team's going to get about $83, $84 million to work with. You also have Tim Laiwiki talking, talking confidently right now about this being the year that we have to turn our attention to bringing the Sonics back to Seattle. That means that some of those wheels have to be turning, that discussions are taking place but I think Detlef is right, probably at least three more years. Uh, the question, though, is, is can they make the economics work from an ownership standpoint if they're going to play in the new arena at uh, Seattle Center? You know, you look at just what has happened the last year, right, with where the wealth has gone, and especially in our market with technology. You know, the rich have gotten tremendously richer. Uh, so $2 billion, $5 billion, $10 billion doesn't really seem to be an issue anymore. So it just unless, takes a commitment from hedging, literally one person. Unless, unless they're hedging yeah. GameStop, of course. Yeah, <laughs> that's craziness. <laughs> but, you know, you're looking at that guy and it's, it just takes a commitment like a Steve Ballmer who said, I don't care how much it costs. I want a team and bought the Clippers. Um, and that's, you know, to there's enough money here if somebody says, you know, let's let's start the process. But it takes somebody to seriously that, that has the money uh, game, you know, and they jump into it. Because I, from a money perspective, it will probably take a while to recover. Yeah. I want to know, Debt, do you have any interest in being involved if the Sonics come back? Yeah, I want to be right next to KJ and cheering like this <laughs> and having my popcorn in my hand. And uh, my, my time, uh, I had all that. You know, we used to be at the Mariners game, the Seahawks game, you know. <laughs> Kenny Griffey Jr. and guys would come over and shoot around with us. I mean, it was a great time in, in Seattle in the sports community. And, uh, you know, and because it creates that really community feeling. And I hope we can get back to it. Can I save yeah. a seat next to you guys? Come kick it. Come kick it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun. I'll, I'll be in the, the nosebleeds. I'll, I'll wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring the sodas and the red vines and we'll have a grand old time. <laughs> now, on a more serious note for our next topic, um, it was unfortunately the anniversary of a horrible and terrible event that happened in 2020, the loss of Kobe Bryant and his beautiful daughter Gianna and, and so many others in that terrible helicopter crash a year ago. Um, if there's anything that we can try and take away from that, though, is the beautiful legacy um, and the love that everyone remembers of that family and all the others lost. Um, what have you guys kind of thought in, in the last year, having time to reflect on that and the way Kobe's legacy is being portrayed and remembered um, is, is, what do you find in that? Yeah, um, anybody that knows me knows that I love Kobe and he has been my guy since I was, you know, a little boy. And so 
everything that he did on, on the foot, on the basketball court and all I tried to exemplify in my life, just his grit, his toughness, his, you know, the way he was as a, as a dad, all this stuff was just uh, amazing. And so on. Um, it was so unfortunate that that happened. And I was actually watching a clip of him yesterday and he was talking about greatness and he's like, somebody asked him, what does greatness mean to you? And he was like, greatness to me is when you inspire other people and when you bring other people to higher levels than they ever thought that they could reach. And so just certain quotes like that have always inspired me and um, he'll truly be missed and um, forever a legend. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, um, Kobe and I, we overlapped a little bit. It tells you how old I am because, you know, he's, he played for 20 years or so, <laughs> but, uh, but what I remember at the start was that it was all about being a competitor. You know, he, he did everything you wanted your star player to be, you know, and he, he was, he was in early, he stayed late, he prepared, he watched film, he lifted weights, he st you know, stayed in shape, he did rehab, he did everything, you know, from that standpoint, I think he couldn't have had a better role model, but I think as he matured, he turned into more than that because he became outspoken, he became a leader, um, you know, he's got great quotes, which, you know, for some of us, it's hard to, to put into words sometimes what we're thinking. But um, what really impressed me is when he started having daughters and he became this, this advocate for women, for women in sports. And that's what I remember, him sitting at courtside with his daughter or daughters, uh, him shooting baskets, you know, and, and um, I, I think he means a lot to people uh, because of that relationship and the softness he showed to not just being a competitor, but really being that, that great dad. I think both of you guys nailed it head on. And we start this whole conversation today about Tom Brady and then come around to Kobe Bryant. And we're talking about generational icons here. And I think Kobe's impact on the basketball court, it was incredible. But I also touched on it a couple of weeks when we were talking about Tiger Woods and Det talked about it there. You know, Kobe Bryant was able to rehabilitate himself into a stand-up human being. And from all accounts, a good husband, an exceptional father, a guy who gave back in terms of charity in his own time. In fact, a lot more than people even realized until the unfortunate tragedy. He didn't want the publicity. Uh, what I take away from his legacy is that people can kind of rebrand their image. And even though it takes time, it is possible. And in terms of Kobe Bryant, it was the most heartbreaking thing for me to see because he wasn't gonna have a chance to be a full-time father. He loved those girls so much and they loved him so much. And it kind of tears me apart to think that we weren't able to see what kind of dad and mentor he could be to Gigi and what kind of player and person Gigi could grow into as well. I think that's what hits home with so many people here. Yes, we lost a legend, but we also lost two incredible human beings that had so much more to give this world. Beautifully said, all of you guys. And if there's anything that we can take away from all of it is try to exemplify those qualities in our lives moving forward. Um, well, that does it. You guys were out of time today, but I just so appreciate your opinions, your insight. We, we hit a lot of things. Uh, you got to come back and be a part of Just a Bit Outside with us again, please. Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. Up next, I caught up with Sounders head coach Brian Schmetzer, a man who's been a part of the organization for nearly 20 years. In his time as head coach since he took over in 2016, Schmetzer has led Seattle to a 67-37-34 record with two MLS Cup championships and four appearances. Well, Coach, first of all, it's great to see you and a huge congratulations in store. So happy to see that a new deal has been worked out, keeping you with our Seattle Sounders. Yes, I'm, I'm very happy, Michelle. I mean, look, it, 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 it was a long process. Uh, there were obviously a lot of factors, uh, but I had confidence. I mean, look, Adrian and I have gone back way back since 2002. We had a lot of conversations and COVID and everything. And I just pleased that it finally was pushed over the finish line and happy to be coaching my hometown club again. You were very diplomatic at the end of the season when asked about contracts and wanting to come back and all the speculation of how your style would, would translate if you went other places in Major League Soccer or beyond. And I'm curious, have you ever thought what it would be like to coach someplace else? Do you think it would bring you as much joy or do you think because of your history and love for the city and the club here is what adds to kind of your special bond but also why you love your job so much? Well, I love my job so much because of the people that are behind me and my green screen back there, the, the people down there in the South End. Uh, 
I love my job for a lot of different reasons. It's home. Uh, it's a great organization. But yeah, it's still pro sports. It still is a business. And certainly there are times when you think you allow yourself to go to, okay, what if, what, you know, what if we don't come to terms or what if there's the day that I'm going to get released from my job, because that's a, that, that is a possibility. That's what I have to think about. So yeah, you kind of go down that path and say, okay, which team and you know, what, who's good and who are the rivals and who wouldn't you go to, you know, down South about a hundred and some odd miles. Uh, but you know, it, it, it comes across every now and again, but I'm just happy and pleased that we got this deal done. Is there anything that you can tell us at this point um, about kind of what's staying intact or any changes or anything that's coming to your coaching staff? Um, because obviously you th yeah. we all think so highly about all of them as well and would like to see a lot of returns too. Yeah, I, I, I'm really, really pleased to kind of let you in on a little bit of a secret. I mean, we're not going to announce it today, but I'm fairly comfortable and confident that we'll get uh, Gonzo, Jimmy, Precky, Tommy all re-signed for the next uh, upcoming year. I look forward to working with those guys. Those guys are so talented. They're such a big part of why we are successful. I mean, if you look at their resumes, you know, Jimmy Torreira is a Champions League winner. Uh, Precky is a former MLS coach of the year. Tommy Dutra is the best goalkeeper coach in MLS. No hands, no, no no doubt in my mind. And look, Gonzo got a lot of uh, press, you know, in the off season about his own, you know, head coaching job. So he's super talented. So happy to, you know, gotta do a few more things left, but uh, get them across the finish line as well and get ready to start the season. As we kind of gear up for the season, obviously there's still a lot of unknowns and whatnot, um, but kind of bigger picture too, just with the way that the season always plays out, you know, in the start of the new year, training camp, you know, usually starting at the end of January, all kind yeah. of coincides with when people normally kind of start anew themselves and set goals for the year and all that kind of stuff. Do you use the off season for goal setting or do you wait until the regular season starts? Do you, do you look at certain milestones or can you, can you let us into kind of your process at all when yeah. preparing mentally like that? Sure. I mean, look, mentally this year, you know, I, I'll go back to 2018, you know, because we had not won in Toronto in 2017. And there's a little bit of fire in the belly. You know, there's a little bit of already I've done a lot of re reflection about that game and that performance and how do we move forward? How do we push past that? Yet retaining some of that, you know, feeling of anger and pain when we didn't play our best in that in that final so the coaching staff has already thought about the messaging when we start again we've already talked about certain you know lineup things and how are we going to change and what's new that we can keep the players engaged so we have all of those discussions prior to the first day and then as usual every you know every preseason I usually put together a little powerpoint and introduce make introductions and introduce the new players, new staff members, all of that. And then we go out on the field and do our job. With things kind of up in the air this year, and Garth made that pretty clear right now, he was saying it, he's, he thought it was kind of a, an added benefit, actually, of all years that your team was getting this time to rest since they went all the way up till mid-December, all this stuff. You mentioned the fire in your belly because obviously 2020 didn't end the way you wanted it to or any of us wanted it to. Um, do you see this kind of uncertainty as like, yeah, good, let it rest, let it be? Or are you kind of like, no, let's get back. I want to get going because that fire is burning. Well, I think it's <clears throat> I think it's twofold. I think coaches want to get back out on the field. I think we want, we're want we anxious. Some of the players might need that additional physical rest and mental rest. I think that's good. But then, Michelle, the, the, the thing that you have to balance that with is the actual physical preparation for a new season. So we're already thinking in the back of our minds, all the fitness guys, the medical staff, they're already thinking about, okay, what are the off-season workouts like for the players? What are they doing? How are we making sure we keep tabs on players that might be out of the country coming back in with some of the you know, COVID restrictions. So there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. I'm anxious. I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, I want it to start, but for the players, there is that little bit of physical rest that's good for them. 
Has there been anything that stuck out to you as you've had time now to reflect fully on 2020? Because, you know, it's been about a month since we had a chance to talk to you. And sometimes with time comes more time of reflection. Is there anything that stands out about last season that maybe wasn't as clear to you right as it ended the last time we chatted? Well, I think I think what what when I reflect on 2020, I'm just super proud of the fact that we went through one of the most challenging years that, you know, and look, I get it. We're talking about pro sports here. We're not talking about the people who are really affected by COVID. But we went through a really challenging time as an organization and decisions had to be made. We had to do things, the league, the the bubble, the, the, the way the season almost had three separate parts, all of that sort of stuff. And we got through that bit of adversity together. I think the medical staff, I think Chris Cornish, our doctors did such a great job of keeping us safe. You know, we had a couple, you know, blips on the radar there, but we, we basically kept our bubble intact. And I think Chris and his staff deserve a ton of credit. I think everybody took it seriously. You know, there there is some, you know, apathy. There's people that are just tired of COVID. They're just tired of it and they don't want to, you know, social distance or they want to go to a restaurant. And, you know, we saw some pro sports franchises in different states that had lesser restrictions and then players got infected and it affected the game and the team and the franchise. So I'm very proud of the fact that our club did a great job keeping everybody safe and playing, playing the sport we love under adverse circumstances. It's really remarkable when you think back on last year and, and you guys returning, and obviously we all wish we could have been in the, in the stands, but just being able to tune in on our televisions or on the radio, it just, it was such a bright moment of joy um, when we really all needed it the most. And kind of moving forward from that, um, there's been some really good joy for the Morris family, finding out last week that it's official that he's headed to Wales to play yes. for Swansea City. Um, obviously, this is a, a young man that you have known and his family for quite some time, with Dr. Morris obviously being with the Sounders. What are your thoughts when when you kind of heard that this was all happening and, and then when it became official? Again, look, it's a little double-edged sword here because we love Jordan. I love, as a coach, I love Jordan. I love what he brings to the team. But obviously, this is such a tremendous opportunity for Jordan. He's earned it. He's ready. You know, I think early on when people were questioning whether he should go to Europe or not, maybe he just wasn't ready. Now he's ready. Now it's his decision. It's his decision to say, you know what, let me take this next step and see what happens. So super, super proud of him for developing, well, proud of Dr. Morris and Mrs. Morris just you know, you, you raise a really fine son, and he's a grounded, well-educated soccer player with tremendous talent, and I wish him nothing but the best. Oh, yes. I think Swansea just gained a whole lot of new fans um, yeah. from the Pacific Northwest <laughs> with this move. Uh, it's still, obviously, a lot of time ahead of the regular season starting now. A lot of question marks still need to be answered. But have you already started thinking like how you're going to change things without if, if Jordan isn't there, which he probably won't be there for the majority yeah. of the season yeah. and, and, and kind of how you're going to work your scheme without such a huge piece to the puzzle? Michelle, we, we definitely have thought about it. We talked about tweaking our formation with and without Jordan. We talked about trying to get Will Bruin and Raul on the field at the same time, two forwards. We discussed some of that stuff, you know, last year. You know, we'll have to rely on some of the crop of younger players. They're going to have to come in and fill some pretty big shoes. And then I would say, lastly, Michelle, that, look, this club has always been a big club. We, we are one of the biggest clubs in MLS. We have always shown that we're willing to spend the money to put ourselves in the opportunity, opportunity to win championships. And I think that's going to still be the case. If Jordan leaves, then we'll get a replacement player. That's just part of pro sports. And I don't have any doubt that Garth will use his expertise to make sure that we have a competitive team. I'd be amiss to let you go without this tough, hard hitting question that I want to ask you right now, because it's something okay. that myself and I know the Sounders faithful have been wondering for the last month, because we all know, you know, you've made it very clear that when you have some time away or some time to yourself, you like to unwind, watch a soccer match and enjoy a nice glass, usually of red wine. 
Mm-hmm. So, given that you've been away for a little while now, have there been any good bottles that you've gotten <laughs> into? Because, you know, I'm I'm a red wine girl myself. <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you that I support local uh, wineries. Uh, California, the rest of the world, they all produce beautiful wines, but I like to buy local, so that's my kind of shtick. That's my spiel. Uh, certainly... I have some favorites. I don't know if I can mention them, but I will. Corliss, Quilcita, uh, Leonetti, those are the expensive ones. But there's a bunch of good wine coming out of the Washington state area that we enjoy uh, with moderation, of course, Michelle. And it's, it's, it's the way we get to unwind because we are in a high pressure job. When I come home, you know, Christine says, okay, talk about your day, but then you know, at some point in time, we just got to unwind and just be ourselves. And, you know, we enjoy our family, our grandkids and all of that. It's, it's, it's nice to have that balance. And hopefully you opened a good bottle to celebrate a much deserved new contract with the Sounders. Coach, as always, appreciate your time. Appreciate all you do for our team and the city and our community. And yeah, congratulations. This is great. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. Happy to be here. Next on Just a Bit Outside, we see if anyone is up to the challenge of defeating our trivia master, Aaron Levine. Here's On the Clock. Well, we're now joined by Christy, but her friends call her Indy. How you doing? Where are you streaming from? I am in Maple Valley, Washington. Maple Valley, shout out to Maple Valley. Uh, give me your favorite local athlete. I see you wearing the, the Seahawks scarf right now. You know, I'm really digging on DK Metcalf right now. Like he's, he's just fantastic. We'll just go with that. Yeah, when, when you <laughs> set a single season record for receiving yards in franchise history, I think you're doing pretty well. Uh, today you're uh, playing for a $100 gift card to Daniel's Broiler. You have to beat me outright to win. These questions are provided by The Fish, Jeff Aaron's Fame Trivia USA. So you can check them out at Fame Trivia USA on Facebook. Uh, Indy, each of us are going to have an answer, uh, have a minute to answer as many questions as possible, and you're going to go first. I'm going to switch headphones right now. Um, I'm going to listen to some Christina Aguilera, as you can hear. Our Jessamine McIntyre is standing by, so good luck. All right, Indy, are you ready for this trivia challenge? Hey, I, think, I think I'm ready. Here we go, Indy. You are officially on the clock. What city was the setting for Russell Crowe's film Gladiator? Pass. What is Bart Simpson's favorite cartoon to watch? Itchy and Scratchy. Name one of the two teams that have defeated Tom Brady and the Patriots in a Super Bowl. Seahawks. What sport is featured in the movie Cool Running starring John Candy? Bobsledding. What kind of animals starred in the family film Happy Feet? Penguins. What U.S. city is home to Motown Records? Detroit. What baseball position did Crash Davis play in the film Field of Dreams? Shortstop. What, which boy band features Justin Timberlake? NSYNC. In what U.S. state will you find the ocean city of Myrtle Beach? South Carolina. What team did Hank Aaron hit the majority of his home runs for? Dodgers. Okay, we are officially done. Aaron, do you want to know how many questions you're up against, or should I just uh, give you guys the final just, score? Let's just go for it. Okay. Uh, okay. Aaron Levine, you are officially on the clock. What city was the setting for Russell Crowe's film Gladiator? Uh, Rome. What is Bart Simpson's favorite cartoon to watch? Pass. Name one of the two teams that have defeated Tom Brady and the Patriots in a Super Bowl. Uh, the Eagles. What sport is featured in the movie Cool Running starring John Candy? Bobsled. What kind of animals starred in the family film Happy Feet? Oh, uh, penguins. What U.S. city is home to Motown Records? Detroit. What baseball position did Crash Davis play in the film Field of Dreams? Uh, uh, catcher. Which boy band features Justin Timberlake? NSYNC. 
In what U.S. state will you find the ocean city of Myrtle Beach? South Carolina. What team did Hank Aaron hit the majority of his home runs for? Braves. What vegetable takes its name from the capital of Belgium? Brussels. Sprouts. Oh, and that'll do it. Wow, Aaron, you did excellent. Krusty the Clown. How did I not get Krusty the Clown? No, you were right. It's itchy and scratchy. Oh, is it itchy and scratchy? Oh, yeah, see, dude, I wouldn't have even been right. <laughs> <laughs> Great game just for playing, Christy. Uh, we've got a Q13 Fox coffee mug for you. Rock and on. so thank you so much for joining us on Just a Bit Outside. Cool. It was, it's an absolute pleasure. Again, the answers. A gladiator took place in Rome. Itchy and scratchy is Bart Simpson's favorite cartoon. The Eagles and Giants have both beaten Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. Bob Sled was featured in Cool Runnings and Penguins star in Happy Feet. Motown Records is in Detroit. Crash Davis played catcher in Field of Dreams. Justin Timberlake was in sync. Myrtle Beach is in South Carolina, and Hank Aaron hit the majority of home runs as an Atlanta Brave. I don't know how long the winning streak will last, Michelle, so I'm just going to enjoy it while it does. Hi, ah, you should, Aaron. And all I can think of is, isn't the jingle, it's the itchy and scratchy show. Maybe? Yes. Maybe? It's, 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 yes, you're right. It's just Thank really you. hard to do it on, on a, I would have said Krusty the Clown anyway, so I guess I was wrong. It's the only one I would have gotten right. So, you know what, as always, even if you don't beat our guests, you always beat me in this category and I should note for all our viewers out there that KJ Wright said today following our roundtable that he wants to take on Aaron at trivia and Aaron you know we both know he's a Jeopardy fanatic so I'd be Bring nervous if I were you Bring it on, KJ. <laughs> all right but moving along we don't have any picks this week but I want to know Aaron how did we fare last week yeah, I'm officially calling it a very successful football season for us and hopefully a lucrative season for our viewers out there and listeners if you took my advice this fall because we finished the season 35-22-1. and one. That is 60% for the season. We were one game away from going a perfect 6-0 and over the last two weeks. Remember, we were 4-0 and two weeks ago. We won with the Bucks in Green Bay. We lost with the Bills in Kansas City. I'm going to have my official Super Bowl pick against the spread next week. And Michelle, our picks will come back when we've got some big college basketball weeks coming up as we approach the NCAA tournament. People better start taking notes if they haven't already because, yeah, I'm thinking, like, why have I not cashed in on this betting of your picks because you're just spot on. Trivia is not the only good thing that you've got going for you right now, Aaron. Well, that does it for this episode of Just a Bit Outside presented by Wafed Bank. Join a best bank at wafedbank.com. Remember, Just a Bit Outside is now a podcast and you can find it wherever you enjoy your podcast, so make sure and download it. And again, you can find all the episodes on justabitoutside.fox. A huge thanks to Coach Brian Schmetzer, KJ Wright, and Detlef Shrimp for joining the show this week. For Aaron Levine and our production team, I'm Michelle Ledka saying thanks for hanging out and we'll see you next time.